<clears throat> so in the second section of this chapter, we are going to look at family and interesting. I like the way they phrase it, how communication creates relationships within the family and also how it keeps those family, keeps those relationships going. And I cannot get right here to the minus. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so the the definition of what a family is is has has changed radically over the past let's say 40 years and when i was growing up it was definitely a family was a mother and father who had either biological or adopted children and that was kind of it. and then of course you know there were grandparents and aunts and uncles and okay but with the way society has changed the definition of family has changed and so Kathleen Galvin and her colleagues have come up with the idea that a family is a system with two or more interdependent people bound by commitment legal or otherwise who have a common history and a present reality and who expect to influence each other in the future and the idea that um, ah, that families are defined primarily through their interactions. It's how we interact with each other that uh, that indicates and and reinforces who we are as a family. So there's a picture here, and that ties to the. There's a video called Thanksgiving Grandma. And it, I, I think if you watch this, you will get an idea of how families evolve and see if this relationship, when you watch the video, does it actually follow the definition that is there? Okay. So <clears throat> basically the textbook talks about how we create the family through communication because there is such a thing called family narratives. If you go all the way back to uh, chapter five, which talked about, was it chapter five? Chapter six talked about language, narratives, perception talked about narratives. Yes, that was chapter five. These are the stories that that we tell each other and that we tell ourselves. So every family has their stories. And 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 these are the um what the, the role of family narratives are. They reinforce the shared goals. Okay, you know, that there's kind of it's almost like the moral of the story, you know, you know, and then this is why this is this is you know what the family is working towards. This is what we value. This is what's important to the family. This is how we interact with each other. Um, this is how, uh, you know, this is what we expect. How we expect you to behave in in the in the world. So I like the questions they ask at the end of this section. Um, what are some of the stories you've heard when your family gets together? What does that narrative say about how your family operates? What is the, yeah, what's the underlying moral to the story? <clears throat> how has that influenced the way you see the world and communicate with others? Okay, so I, this is something I'm hoping that we can talk about in in class to to kind of drill down and figure out well what are what are our family narratives? Okay. More communication in the family that goes beyond the stories that are we've been told are rituals that the family has specifically regarding communication and rules that we have regarding communications. So <clears throat> um, if you think about it, especially now as we're getting closer to Thanksgiving, a lot of the family rituals sent are, are based on... Um, celebrations the family gets together for certain holidays for birthdays for weddings but there are also um rituals that are uh 
part of you know the the everyday life as opposed to the the special occasions um <clears throat> I don't know. When I when I was growing up, there was a show on TV called The Waltons about a, a, a large family in, uh-huh, Virginia, maybe? In, in any case, the, the show always ended with, you know, it was night. You could see lights in windows, and everyone in the family would be, be calling out good nights to each other. So that that is a a ritual. Okay. And families have their own rules about communication. What are things that the family will talk about? What are things that the family will not talk about? Um, are there certain expectations uh, um, that, well, as the textbook says, you know, if you're, you're going to be if you're going to be late, you need to call. I've talked about how one of the rules we have is when we we travel. So, you know, my sister lives in Colorado. When she flies out, you know, she'll come out to visit. When she gets home, we expect her to text when she's finally made it back home. Okay. Um, <clears throat> families, and, you know, that includes step, step families, have rules that, that, you know, that that say this is how we talk with each other. This is how we talk with outsiders. And the textbook is making the uh, case or, or presenting the case that step families have added, have added difficulties maybe in communication. So anyways, um, here's the question. Think about what are some of the rituals in your family? What are some of the rules in your family that deal with communication? Are there topics that you don't talk about? Are there topics that you talk about, but you don't talk about with grandma? You know, these kinds of things. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to look at the, the patterns of family communication, which to me, I, this is a really interesting part. And so family, if you think about a family as a, as a communication system, there are three points to think about that the family members are interdependent, which makes sense, right? Everyone depends on the other. And they say, for example, if you think about uh, a, a, a mobile, you know, sometimes they hang this above a, a, a baby's crib. Um, and we actually had a, one when I was growing up, kind of a modern art thing. and. You know there are there are wires and pieces hanging down, and if you touched one piece of this this hanging sculpture, the whole thing would move. All right, so you cannot affect one member of the family without impacting the whole family. And then the idea that the family is more than the sum of its parts. So you know one member of the family, but you you don't understand that that whole family until you you know you you see everyone together okay and they think good good example you know you know someone pretty well and then uh you actually go and you you visit with their family and you see a, a different side of that person okay and then the last one the family Families have systems within the larger system. So they say, all right, let's take, for example, in my family, um, my husband and I and our two children. <clears throat> so we could have the system of uh, my husband and I, uh, my daughter and me, um, my son and me, my husband and daughter, my husband and son, and my my two children. So that's six subsystems within the larger family system. And then we also have something that they called ah, supra system, okay? Which is the idea that, you know, then there's also, we could, we could go up that family tree and we can look at, you know, um, how we interact with, with the, the, the grandparents and, and the, you know, my sisters and brothers, my husband's sisters and brothers. Okay, so. Think about all the communication that's going on here. Okay, so now we're going to look at two 
very important aspects that get to uh, a kind of communication pattern that exists. Okay, so we can measure uh, how a family, what what the family's um, feeling about discussion is. This is called the conversation orientation. So. And we're making it very simple. It can be high or it can be low. If it is a high conversation orientation, members of the family interact freely, frequently, spontaneously. Okay. If it is a low conversation, it, it's basically the fam the, the 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 family does not necessarily value communication. People don't interact very much, or they don't share a lot of their private thoughts. You know, how was school today? Great. Okay. Mm. <laughs> All right. The other area that we will look at here is conformity orientation. And this is how much does family communication stress following the, the rules? You know, uh, we all have the same attitudes, values, and beliefs. Okay. Sorry, I needed a sip of coffee. So if it's high conformity orientation, the family want, it, it wants uh, or, or seeks harmony. We're all on the same page, uh, interdependence. We all depend on each other. What you do reflects on the family and obedience. When I say this, this is what, you know, this is, you have to do what I say. If there's a low conformity orientation, the then the family communication stresses individuality. Do your own thing. Oh, I think that's supposed to be <laughs> independence, not interdependence. Okay, I got to fix that. Okay, <clears throat> so let's take a look at this very interesting uh, square. All right, so what happens is you have where the conformity orientation and the conversation orientation um, inter, um, connect. Okay, so I'm gonna start at the, the bottom left. So if you have a family that, okay, that values, let's talk about this, and low conformity where, you know, you are an individual, that's called a pluralistic family. So they use this great, example of um, the, how old was she? Uh, the 15 year old daughter wants to get a tattoo. I don't know, let's, let's say she wants to get a tattoo where it says very visible on her forehead. No, <laughs> um, and it's not, you know, it's not like she's gonna get a little rose tattooed on, on her wrist. It's, it's something maybe a little bit bigger. So what would happen in this pluralistic Oh, they start with, with consensual, but I'll start with pro pluralistic. Uh, they talk about it, you know, it, you know, mom and dad talk about it. They talk with the daughter. They, they ask the dog and grandma, and then they say to the young woman, you know, you make up, you make up your mind and yes, we'll go, we'll sign the papers for you. In a consensual family where they're still talking about it a lot, but it's, but it's basically, it comes down to the parent's decision at, at the end. You know, we have certain rules and you will follow the rules. That's consensual. In a protective family, it's very much of, uh, we're not going to talk about this and you're going to do what I say. And then the last one is uh, the laissez-faire family, which is we're not going to talk about it and you can do what you want. Okay, so what was the family that, oh, that's my next slide. <laughs> oh, no, it is not the next slide. Okay. All right. Uh, think about the family in which you grew up. And I'm not talking about when you were five or, you know, when you were young, because <laughs> for most, they're very, I think it is relatively rare that in a family with young children, the parents are saying, um, you know, you, do, you choose your own bedtime, honey. Yes, you're four, but you go to bed whenever you want. Um, I'm thinking about more probably when you became a teenager. Yeah, you know, 13 through 
18, roughly, where do you, did you think your family uh, was? And if you are not exactly sure, you can look on page 320. There's a very short um, assessing your communication that looks at our communication pattern. Okay, so in order for a family to have effective communication, there are two dialectics, if you remember from last chapter, Two dialectics that, uh, that that come into play here, and one of them is this: the connection autonomy. How much does the family function as a unit, and how much uh, leeway do pe do people have to be an individual? Okay, and obviously this happens when the children grow into adolescence. You know, you probably remember yourself as a maybe 15, I'm trying to remember if that's when it started with my daughter. You know this, I just don't, I don't want to be with my family. They're so annoying. And then something happens and it's like, I need to be with my family. So it's going that back and forth. Okay. <sighs> Communication is most, um, mm -mm. families are, are most successful in dealing with this a connection autonomy dialectic if they are flexible. And they can change their communication and they don't say, well, this is the way we've always done things. Okay. That, <clears throat> you know, maybe parents want, I, I remember I wanted my daughter to spend more time at home when we finally could have like good, more in-depth conversations. She didn't want to spend time with her mother. She wanted to spend time with her friends. So the... You know, when, when she moved out, the, the, we had to decide. Um, she, we, don't, we don't call very much. In fact, when she calls me, it's usually something's wrong. But we text all the time. So, you know, how family has to decide how to stay connected because the person now has a lot more autonomy. And then what happens is as, as uh, one person leaves that that system, right? Because they're no longer in the house. The relationships within the family change. The, um, you know, uh, the relationship that the parents have with the, the children who are still at home changes. The, um, when I, I was very close with my younger sister, when I went away to college, I wasn't there for daily interactions. And when I came back, I found that my younger sister and my youngest sister, who had been pretty much left out, they were very close. And now I was the one on the outside and it felt crappy. Okay. And the relationship keeps changing because, you know, um, when you have, uh, at a certain point and, uh, as the, the, the child and the family grows up into an adult and the parent becomes elderly, this whole connection autonomy dialect comes into play again. Your parents are now elderly. How connected are you? How much do you let them do things on, on their own? You know, um, this is something that I'm talking about with my siblings, like how we, we want my mom to be independent, but we need to, we, we're feeling we need to be closer connected. Okay. <sighs> we're also looking at the integration, separation, and the expression privacy dialect. Um, what kind of boundaries do we create? Do we, you know, are, are, uh, do we talk about everything? Uh, do we, uh, allow people privacy? Does everything have to be shared? And so the idea is that there have to be boundaries. And then another, the, the, uh, a lot of a lot of these kind of charts in in this textbook. Um, so they give the, uh, the, the they talk about, for example, uh, a child has gone away to college, and their their parents want to they want to talk about you know how are you doing in 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 college, and there are four different strategies for dealing with privacy management. So the upper left, the surrendered, where 
the parents are always, they, they use it as an invasion, right? They're constantly asking the question. And, you know, what's, what's the latest on your grades? Still the same, mostly Ds. Okay, they're not, the, the kid has just, the, kid, the child has just surrendered. Okay, we'll go to the right. It could be combative. You know, for the last time, tell me about your grades. For the last time, it's none of your business. Okay. It could be trust. Well, let's see, we'll go down. Could be guarded. Hey, how are your classes going this month? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. And then obviously the blue uh, box is hopefully the one we would most work towards because it's trusting, you know, where it's like, hey, how's, how's school? Can, notice the question was not how are your grades, it was just how's school. You know, well, grades aren't so hot. Okay. So every family has to strive for closeness while still respecting the boundaries that exist. Okay. And it doesn't have to be about school. Could be about could be about anything. Okay. So we will talk about this more in uh, the last chapter that talks about confirming and disconfirming messages. But ideally, families, okay, there are confirming behaviors, confirming communication and disconfirming. And a confirming behavior means a parent would tell the children that they are unique. I mean, all, all parents do that, right? And as, as you are valuable as a human being and they listen to their kids, Disconfirming behavior would be belittling uh, kids. You know, I can't believe you were so stupid and you did this. Um, you know, and as opposed to, uh, oh, you know, um, when you left the milk out of the refrigerator, that wasn't a good thing to do. Where you're you're focusing on that that behavior, and instead of you, you're so stupid because you left the milk out of the fridge where you are focusing on this, the, the child's personality. And, okay. And then you would make a, a, a disconfirming would be letting the, the children know that their ideas don't count. Okay. It's not just about five-year-olds. You know, it's important for the, the child as they grow. And, you know, I, I would even argue, even when they no longer live in the house, they're on their own, we still want to get confirming messages from people who are important to us. <clears throat> and it's not just the parents who are the source of confirming or disconfirming messages. Siblings are also a source of confirming messages or disconfirming messages. So three sets of questions here. What is the definition of family according to this textbook? Is it the same as how you would define family? And then let's take a look at, do you remember those four types of family communication patterns with the conformity orientation and the communication orientation? And when you were growing up as an adolescent, what would you say was the, the pattern that existed in your family and then my question a further question would be if you have your own children or if you already do is do you do you want to do do you want to replicate the same communication pattern that you experienced growing up last of all how can families communicate effectively and depending on, oh man, <laughs> uh, uh, how, <laughs> how does your family manage that should be dialectical tensions or how, if you know, you've, you're, um, outside of the, your family pretty much now, how did your family manage these tensions? All right. So that's the second section all about family communication. We will move on to the last section in a bit.